All right, enough of the friendliness and chatter and banter. Uh, no, actually, it's, it's always hard to interrupt that um, because it's so fun to see each other, and especially in a time of pandemic when we're all like supposed to be not seeing anybody. Uh, but I'm going to have Abby come up here. Abby is, Emmy Lambert is one of our uh, staff people here at Restoration. If you haven't had a chance to get to know Abby, you should because she is an unbelievable young woman. And we are so excited and privileged to have you here to share with us what you have learned and what God has been teaching you. So let me pray for you and then, um, and then yeah, the, it's yours. Uh, Father, thank you this morning for Abby. Thank you for everything that you have been teaching her, how you have been moving her. God, it is so clear to see your spirit alive in her and in everything that she's doing. Mm, She just reflects your heart, Jesus. And so we want to hear from her this morning. We want to hear what she is learning, how you have been moving. More than that, God, we just want want to hear your heart through her. So we pray for that this morning. Holy Spirit, come and just fill us. Uh, Give us eyes to see what you are saying and ears to hear what you want to say to us this morning, Jesus. We pray that in your name. Amen. Amen. Hello, like Josh said, my name is Abby Lambert and I'm an intern here at Restoration Church. I'm also on part-time Young Life staff at Andrew Lewis Middle School where I was a wildlife leader all through college. That being said, the last four years, I've only talked to big groups of middle schoolers, so the height difference of this crowd is throwing me a little bit. I got married this past August to the love of my life, Liam Lambert, and what does a newly married couple do in the midst of a pandemic when you can't really go anywhere? Binge watch a movie series. We decided to watch all of the Marvel movies in chronological order. Now, before this, I had watched a few random Marvel movies, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Captain America, I think one of the Iron Mans, but I had missed a huge chunk of them. I thought that they were good by themselves, great even, but watch them in order, oh my goodness, incredible. See, what I had gotten before was just a little snippet of the Marvel picture, But when I watched them in order, I had experienced a bigger, larger, fuller story. If you were like me before this fall and didn't know that an overarching Marvel story exists, one does. It's called the Marvel Universe and they all fit together. The producers and writers make sure that each movie has plot, character development, CGI, most of the time a love story, all the things that make a good movie. But the incredible thing is that they took all 22 movies in the universe and threaded them together so that it creates this big, full, large story. So when you watch it all the way through, you see a story played out over 40-something hours instead of just two. You see amazing character development, growth. You see entire lives happen right in front of you. I spent hours and hours and hours invested in the storyline. Before this fall, I was mildly impressed at best, but after spending 22 movies deep in the Marvel Universe, I'm obsessed. You might recognize this scene from the last movie. If you haven't seen Endgame, cover your ears and your eyes, and if you really hate spoilers, feel free to step outside for like three minutes. You can rest now. In this scene, Iron Man, or Tony Stark, has taken all of the Infinity Stones from Thanos, the really bad guy, and reversed all the damage done. Tony Stark literally gave up his life to save the universe. The first time I saw this movie, I literally sobbed. This scene wrecked me, like way more than it probably should have. And to be honest, when I was prepping for this and watched it again, I cried again. Why? Because I had watched Tony Stark grow, develop, find his calling in a larger story. He went from genius, billionaire, playboy, philanthropist, to the Tony Stark that gave up everything to save the Marvel Universe. Part of this internship year at Restoration Church, we have classes taught each week, a majority by Josh, but guest teachers as well. I leave each class 
wishing I was a sponge or a voice recorder and can just soak up every word that's being said. This vast section was about biblical history and theology, something that I didn't have much exposure to before this internship. What Josh and Jeff painted for Hannah and I throughout class was the overarching story of the Bible called the Meta Narrative. The 66 book, 1,189 chapter, 31,102 verse story of the Bible that stretches from Genesis to Revelation, the whole picture, the biblical universe, as one may say. Now, I had studied books and stories before, and they are great, full of wisdom and knowledge and truths about the Lord. But understand the whole story that the Lord is telling threaded throughout the Bible, it was transformational. Throughout this series, we are talking about the concept of focus. But this morning, I'm gonna ask us to zoom out a little and look at the overarching story of the Bible. So often, the meta narrative, or this overarching story of the Bible, is described as the movement through creation, the fall, redemption to restoration. And this is the story that we are invited to be a part of. So that's what we're gonna walk through this morning. Basically, we're gonna cover the whole Bible. And I know that's an ambitious undertaking for the intern, but this tool is something that's really changed my view of the Bible, so bear with me. So like all good stories, there is a beginning, creation. We start with this beautiful picture of the garden. Genesis opens with a description of the formation of our world with the creation of heaven and earth. There is sudden light in the creation of skies. God separates the water from solid ground so that there is land and sea. Next, the Lord creates vegetation and plants and trees cover the earth. The Lord sees that it's good, but keeps going. He creates the sun and moon and stars to separate the day from the night. It gives the earth a difference between light and darkness. And then he creates living creatures to fill the earth and the sky. And birds fly above the earth, and creatures move in the sea, and living things move along the earth, all according to their kinds. And then the Lord makes mankind to have dominion over the living creatures. So the Lord makes mankind in his image. Male and female, he creates them. He creates Adam and Eve and is with them. And it is good, and it is beautiful, and it is made for humans to flourish in right relationship with God. We can see creation as the way that things were supposed to be. In Colossians 1, 16, it says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. We see that God has written a story in which we humans have purpose. We were created by him and for him. He has given us a part in the story of creation. And then the tragedy of part two, the fall. We see sin become part of the story. It breaks our right relationship with God. It's man's fall from God. In Genesis 2, 15 through 17, we see Lord command the man, you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. From when you eat from it, you will certainly die. But the devil is crafty and says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And then we see Eve's sense of right and wrong and the truth erode. Verse 6 says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then Adam and Eve's eyes were open and they realized they were naked. They were no longer innocent. Feeling shame, they covered themselves and hid. And then the Lord comes to walk in the cool of the day and notices Adam and Eve hiding, and he calls to them. And Adam answers, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And the Lord responds by asking, who told you you were naked? 
Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? The Lord gave them everything in this beautiful, perfect garden. But Adam and Eve made a decision to act rebelliously against the rule of the Lord. Through their disobedience, they rejected God's boundaries and for them and his trust in them. And what happened because of this? The separation of sin, keeping us from the purpose that we were intended and made to have. I saw it said somewhere as though the cosmos were fractured. That act of rebellion leaves us in a place where our relationship with God is broken. We see humans choosing things that are less than what God intended for us. The fall meant not only that sin enters our world, but that we are separated from the purpose that God intended for us. God made us in his image, but we are alienated from God because of this rebellion against his goodness. But the good news is that he doesn't leave us in this broken state. We don't have to be there now. Right in Genesis 3, we see the promise of redemption. Redemption is the rescuing from sin. It is the buying out of bondage. It is the freedom we receive through the price paid. After Adam and Eve admit their act of disobedience, God addresses the serpent, meaning Satan, and says, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all wild stock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring, your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, but you will strike his heel. I'm going to pause here for a second because this is something that's truly radical. Think about the struggle between a man and a snake. The snake can reach up and inflict temporary pain with a bite. The bite to an ankle will hurt, but it's not a fatal strike. But a man crushing a snake's head, that's something that can't be overcome. That's fatal to the snake in every sort of way. What you will do, Satan, is mildly affect our Savior, but he, he will end you, win the fight, offer hope of what can be, what was intended to be. In sin and separation, God gave us the promise of Jesus, a story that's written into the rest of the Bible. We see the larger implications of sin from this point to Genesis 12. We see Cain and Abel. We see the flood in Noah. We see the Tower of Babel. All interesting histories and stories I implore you to read. But we are going to pick back up in Genesis 12, where the Lord lays out his plan for redemption through his servant Abraham, saying, Genesis 12, 2 through 3, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Here, we not only see the Lord promising redemption through Abraham, through Jesus, who will come through the line of Abraham, but he also redeems our purpose. From Genesis 12 to Revelation 22, we see the Lord's great plan for salvation. The story hits the climax with the death and resurrection of Jesus, the point where we get to return to that right relationship with God. We are freed from the wages of sin and death and freed to a life with Jesus. Most of history so far is lived in this point of redemption, The Lord invites us back into the narrative. We get to be a blessing to all peoples on earth through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are invited into the great and epic story that the Lord is writing. But the story doesn't end in this state, and I'm so glad that it doesn't. God didn't intend to leave us in this position. We look around in our world, and we still see sin and hurt disasters, sickness, and unrest. But he offers us the hope of a new world full of restoration. Restoration is the bringing back of something to its original intent. We see at the end of the Bible 
the heart of God to restore freedom and joy and wholeness to his creation. We are going to take a look at pieces of Revelation 21 and 22 today. Um, when Hannah and I first proposed and we're doc- talking about what we wanted our reflection topics to be, Um, I jokingly said to Josh that I wanted to cover the entire book of Revelation, and I've never seen Josh's face get so worried in an instant. So, keeping with my word, here we go. Revelation 21, 1 through 4 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. What we get in this passage is not only the image of a beautiful new city, but the restoration of the biggest thing we lost in the fall. Verse three says that God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with him. We get to return to what Adam once had, walking with God in the cool of the day. We get to return to close fellowship with our creator. Revelation 22, one through five says, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. We see the restoration of an Eden where the throne of God and of the Lamb will reign forever and ever. We get to return to where man is in the beginning all the way back in Genesis, and where man was intended to be, a beautiful paradise with God. John's revelation throughout the last book of the Bible paints a vague picture of what eternity will look like. But what isn't vague is the hope found in the restoration of God's people. So we made it to the end. Phew, thanks for hanging on with me. This is really the story of the gospel told over pages and pages of man's losses, victories, and a God that is full of forgiveness and redemption and restoration. It's a story that we get to be a part of. So as we look back on the meta-narrative of the Bible, walked through quickly in the last 10 minutes, I see two truths that are things that have become more evident to me throughout setting the meta-narrative and things I think we should be aware of today. Number one, if we understand the whole, we can better understand and experience and give meaning to the pieces. When I was reading for this time and reflecting on what the Lord has been showing me in the meta narrative, I found this John Piper quote. In profound ways, the whole Bible, the whole of redemptive history, exists to create a place and time and meaning where particular individual finite humans can encounter its stunning parts. The parts make up the whole and so serve the whole. They would have no meaning and no beauty without the whole. But it's just as important to say that the whole exists to give place and time and meaning to the parts so the parts can be known and experienced and enjoy. John Piper is basically saying that when we understand the whole picture of the Bible, we can get a deeper understanding of what's happening in each piece of scripture. It's like only looking at the corner of a picture. It is still art and beautiful, colorful and technical, but we can't see how it fits into a larger picture. Backing up to see the whole, we can understand how important, valuable, 
and the meaning of that little part, we can see how it's vital to the whole picture. And number two, this story gives purpose, meaning, and identity to our lives. We know who the Lord created us to be and how we can be a part of that story now. Paul is someone who understood this so well and got the full picture. So Paul was a man who before a really cool encounter with Jesus actively persecuted Christians in horrendous ways. After he was transformed, he became one of the most influential people to the early church. He took missionary journeys and influenced areas and wrote letters that became 13 books of the New Testament. Paul, having a really amazing redemptive story, understood the whole epic story that the Lord was writing through him and humanity and the purpose bestowed upon us. So in Ephesians 1, 4 through 10, we see Paul say, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us, who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in, on heaven and on earth. Breaking this down, we see in verse 4 the way that the, the world was intended to be in creation, holy and without fault in his sight. He has predestined us to adoption to his family through Jesus Christ because we were no longer in that right relationship with the Lord. How? Verse 7 shows us how redemption through the blood of Christ is offered to us. And in verse 10, we see the hope of restoration, that is, that there's going to be unity of all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Verse 11 and 12 go on to say, Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose is that, is that we Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. The Lord has created us to be part of the story. He has created us that we have a place in God's epic narrative. In Exodus 19.6, the Lord calls the Israelites to this and says, You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He calls Israel to be a priest, to be the in-between himself and the world, to be set apart. We see a book close to the end of the Bible say this a very similar thing to this as this book in the beginning of the Bible. In 1 Peter 2, 9, Peter says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Peter is repeating who we are and what through Christ we were created to do. This concept of the meta narrative has been huge for me. Not only has it helped me better understand the Bible, it's helped me understand my greater calling as a follower of Christ. When I can focus on the overarching story that the Lord is writing in my life, it gives so much more meaning to the individual scenes. I wonder if someone had told Tony Stark that his purpose was to save the universe. Would it have changed the way he felt about the rest of his life? Would the natural skills, struggles, and heartaches have felt more meaningful for him? Right now, the scene in my life is this internship. But after this, I'm not sure what the Lord has for me. I don't know all the reasons why the Lord has me in Salem right now. I have definitely, definitely gotten glimpses of that over this year and glimpses of what the Lord is doing. But I'm not sure of the larger implications of this year quite yet. Maybe I'll get a more full picture years down the road and maybe I never will. But I do know that the Lord has made me with a purpose. 
he has called me to be a part of this epic story. And that gives this moment right here a more full meaning. So because of this overarching story and to better understand the Lord, my goal this year is to read the Bible all the way through. When Liam and I started watching the Marvel movies, we did it in like 30 minute chunks. It would sometimes take us longer than a week to watch one movie. Um, we would just keep plugging along. And I'm gonna be honest with you, it definitely was not my idea to watch the Marvel movies all the way through in chronological order. But I love my husband, so I said I would give it a try. And the further we got into the story, the more I looked forward to the next part. And that's how I felt about reading the Bible all the way through. The Bible app has some really great reading plans that break it down to just a few chapters every day. I saw a post on Instagram that said if you have 12 minutes a day, you can read the whole Bible in a year. If you have six minutes a day, you can read the New Testament in six months. It will definitely take me longer than a year, but I've loved doing it so far. And who cares if it does? Sometimes I miss a day, some days I read one chapter, and some days I read five. The goal isn't to finish the Bible in a year. The goal is to read it. And so far for me, it's been awesome. It gives me a fuller understanding of who the Lord is. So I invite you to join me. See for yourself how the Lord has a plan for you and a place for you in his epic narrative. To take communion together, but uh, I, I love, I love, I love that picture and how the very beginning of the Bible says the same thing as the very end of it, and it creates this picture for us of the story that we have been invited into. Um, and as just as as Abby was talking there, it, it it gives meaning to the individual parts when we can take a step back. So let's pray, Father. We thank you so much for um, for the story that you have invited us into. God, we thank you that we each have a role to play in that story. We pray, God, that it, even as we move into this next season of life, that you would open our eyes to see where we are in the story, what the calling that you have over our life is. Lord, that's the, the word that just keeps coming back, is calling. To what have you called us? To whom have you called us? Lord, open our eyes to see this, the bigger story, the meta narrative that you are writing and our place in it. God, help us to have faith and trust that this story is ultimately about you, but you and your love and your mercy have included us in it. Lord, may there just be joy as we walk into that. God, we trust you as the author. We trust you as the one who is making all things come together for our good and for your glory.